Hey everyone, uh, it's Adam again, and we're going to continue on and finish out our talk of nutrition and, and metabolism within the body. Uh, this will round out the information for section three, uh, and then in the next class session, we'll have the review and then finally the test, uh, which I believe is the next day. So it'll be, um, hopefully you can watch this on Monday and the review on Tuesday, and then we'll have the test on Wednesday. But uh, we'll continue out talking about this, um, including the trace elements. And so we left off. Uh, one of the biggest ones you're going to have is going to be iron. Obviously, we've talked about this uh, previously being really, really important for hemoglobin formation. And we know that without iron, uh, you normally end up getting uh, this kind of um, hypochromic kind of uh, anemia that occurs where basically you don't really have a whole lot of hemoglobin and that uh, decreases the amount of oxygen you can deliver out to the tissues leading to things like fatigue you can have weakness uh, exercise intolerance pallor to kind of a pale uh, complexion and so uh, it can be caused by several different things um, a big one uh, especially in more developing uh, countries and, and places where they don't have good uh, good food sources would be inadequate intake of course and then certainly uh, there can be issues where if you have any kind of like GI disorder, you may have malabsorption of iron, which obviously, uh, even though it may be present in the food, it's not getting into the GI tract. And then finally, one of the biggest reasons for anemia, especially in female patients, uh, especially of childbearing uh, potential, would be blood loss due to the fact that they do, uh, through menstruation, as we've seen previously, um, have a decent amount of blood loss. You lose uh, several milligrams of iron there. And so that's a pretty common reason why um, you know female patients may develop anemias, and so that's why a lot of um, you know prenatal vir vitamins and things like that contain iron because it's so important to make sure that um, those patients have enough uh, iron stores. You know, sometimes you'll see uh, hormonal contraceptives like birth control that will have. Um, iron added as, as well in order to kind of combat that loss. So, um, and moving on from that, next you have zinc. And so this is going to be a, a cofactor for lots of different types of reactions, including things like protein, fat, and carbohydrate metabolism. So if you look at a lot of, um, you know, kind of dietary supplements and things like that that are meant to kind of help with um, utilization of energy and help with like weight loss. And they claim, you know, claim it does, but um, who, who's to say? But basically, zinc is one of those things you'll contain in there in a lot of cases. Um, zinc is also very important for things like wound healing. Uh, and so without that, you can end up finding that patients may have a diminished ability to, um, you know, uh, have good wound healing. Uh, and that can, you know, lead to things like infections and whatnot. So that can be a problem. Also, uh, zinc tends to be uh, somewhat bactericidal, uh, can have some you know, antibacterial capabilities, antiviral capabilities. That's why there's actually some, uh, you ever heard of the, the drug called Zycam? Uh, it's actually a zinc-based product that's meant to be act as an antiviral you know, for things like the common cold and questionable efficacy, but um, does have those properties within the human body. Uh, the nice thing you'll see with a lot of these trace elements is that we typically have pretty good stores uh, within the human body, so it can take a while for you to truly become deficient here. Uh, and so in this case with zinc, um, it can occur anywhere between two weeks uh, to three months based on kind of the intake that's occurring um, through the diet. So if you have inadequate intake, you know, it can be anywhere as short as 14 days up to three months before you'd start to really notice. Uh, one of the big things uh, that will develop here is going to be this uh, these skin lesions. So it's called acrodermatitis uh, enteropathica, and basically uh, it would end up. Uh, there's also some GI issues that come up, you know, some stomatitis and whatnot. But these skin lesions, due to the fact that um, the body's normal um, kind of repair mechanisms are kind of going haywire, because zinc's not there to help out with these uh, enzymes or these uh, reactions. And so uh, here's an example of a interesting iron type of ingestion. Uh, obviously, this is not super germane to our discussion, but I thought it's a very interesting uh, x-ray. Um, this is one of our, our overdose patients, uh, overdose um, in a different type of sense, where um, this is a, a man who had some mental health problems and decided he wanted to become strong. And so he said, well, I know the bodybuilders like to pump iron, so perhaps if I eat a bunch of iron, I will become strong as well. Uh, and as you can see here, here's a lot of nails and screws and basically any kind of metal object he could find he tried to swallow. And you can see how kind of far down uh, this is weighing down his stomach based on kind of where it's sitting at within, uh, you know, in, in relation to the rest of his body. Um, eventually they went through, surgery came through and actually was able to remove uh, all of this, which you can see here uh, in this picture. There's even some um, tiny mini figurines from the Star Wars uh, uh, franchise down here uh see like darth vader and i think boba fett here so it's kind of light versus dark side with luke and, and r2 um so anyway so obviously this is a, not a good way to get iron into your system it is one way but probably not the best way 
Next uh, uh, on the list of trace elements we have are things like copper. This is also a very infor- important factor in certain oxidative enzymes. And so one of the places copper is used with, uh, is with cytochrome oxidase, which is a very important enzyme used during oxidative phosphorylation, which is where we're utilizing oxygen in order to make ATP. Uh, this can also be useful for things like iron metabolism uh, and can help with free radical scavenging. So when you have kind of reactive oxygen species that can go around and denature protein or damage DNA, copper can help it with uh Kind of helping to to reduce those um, products down to where they're less reactive, which is which is a good thing. Um, so some of the problems you can see that occur with deficiency of copper include things like anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. And you can even have um, certain cases where you have this like Minky syndrome, which this is actually kind of more of a congenital um, uh, it's a genetic deficiency. And, and you'll find this especially with a lot of uh, pediatric patients that um, you'll find these genetic um, issues or these metabolic issues that come about, some of it related back to certain amino acids, but some of it can be related back to these trace elements. So on um, this Minky syndrome, you can have things like hypothermia, skin and hair depigmentation, you kind of see in this picture here, uh, this young child, uh, kind of very light pigmentation of the hair and skin, uh, and some pretty significant mental deterioration. Another trace element, chromium. Um, this is actually uh, something you'll find that uh, chromium deficiencies are thought to actually help to uh, develop things like insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes uh, because we know chromium is important for helping with insulin function and maintaining blood glucose levels. So some people feel that if you're you know, kind of chronically chromium deficient in your diet, perhaps this can lead to some of that, um, that insulin resistance and in, in diabetes. Um, because when you see that, when you see the deficiency, you'll notice that it'll be glucose intolerance, meaning the gl- blood glucose will be uh, higher, uh, and even some impaired protein utilization. So it's a, why you'll see that added in um, in certain multivitamins or certain um, trace element uh, mixtures. Uh, selenium, we know we find selenium in things like head and shoulders, uh, helpful with uh, things like dandruff. So you know there's kind of a skin component that uh, selenium can help with. Uh, but there's a group of selenoproteins which are um, basically uh, containing selenium and are, and are useful for several um, things like antioxidative uh, reactions. Uh, they can also help with thyroid hormone production, so it's important to have selenium around for that. Um, and then iodine obviously is going to be uh, kind of the primary trace element that's going to be involved with thyroid hormone production. Um, you kind of find that the thyroid gland will preferentially take up iodine and roughly 70 to 80 percent of the body stores are actually found there. Um, if you have that deficiency, in a lot of cases you can end up developing those goiters, which I've shown pictures of previously. Basically, the, uh, the thyroid gland ends up hypertrophying uh, due to uh, kind of having an overstimulation by things like TSH uh, and then TRH on the, on the pituitary. Basically, that tissue just doesn't have any iodine in order to make thyroid hormone with, so it just gets more and more kind of um, hyperplastic. And so uh, you can kind of assess iodine levels within the body by kind of looking at things like, well, what's the T3 and T4 production, which we know those, you know, T3 being the more active form of of thyroid hormone and then TSH obviously um, being kind of that stimulatory effect from the pituitary onto the thyroid gland. So if that's really high, that in, you know, your T3 and T4 levels are low, that would usually indicate something like, you know, an iodine deficiency, uh, or that could be one reason for an iodine deficiency. Uh, one reason for those, those low T3 and T4 levels could be an iodine deficiency. But um, also note this, if you have too much iodine around, that can also be a problem because that also is seen to actually inhibit thyroid function as well. Okay, so moving on, uh, we'll talk about vitamins. We know these are going to be small organic molecules. Uh, they also help to perform specific functions, usually as coenzymes. And so we have two main classes we've already kind of alluded to before, but your fat-soluble vitamins, which uh, we are going to call A, D, E, and K. Uh, these uh, typically end up getting stored to some degree within the body. The liver is a really big place where a lot of vitamins get stored, which is why if you ever eat, um, uh, if you ever to go eat, eat liver, which I know um, a lot of hip, cool kids like to go out there and you know eat liver. It's actually kind of disgusting. I had it um, one time as kind of a curiosity. It's pretty gross, but I'm very sure that I was getting lots of um, amounts of vitamin K and A and things like that. So, um, but the other issue with that is that you're also more likely for chronic overdosing. If someone was taking way too many uh, fat soluble vitamins, they can end up running into some issues, which uh, we'll talk about in a few cases there where uh, too much vitamin A, D, E, or K can all lead to problems. On the flip side of that, um, you have your water-soluble vitamins. These are like your B vitamins. This includes things like your, uh, vitamin C. Um, the nice thing with these is the fact that they are so water-soluble that in, um, usually what happens if you have too much 
uh, of these vitamins uh, in the system, you end up just kind of peeing them out, which is nice. Um, so it's really hard to overdose uh, from that standpoint as uh, as, compo- uh, as opposed to your fat-soluble vitamins. Um, so if you ever have drank a Red Bull or a Monster Energy drink or something, they have uh, incredible amounts of uh, B vitamins and, and other uh, water-soluble vitamins in them. So if you look on the, the cans, it'll be like, oh, here's you know 40,000% of your B6 or, you know, it's just an example. It's probably not really that much, but um, they have quite a bit uh, of water-soluble vitamins, which again, when you end up um, uh, urinating afterwards, you'll notice that your uh, pee is probably uh, glow in the dark, uh, but very, uh, very fluorescent yellow, uh, yellowish kind of color. And a lot of that's related back to those B vitamins. You just have too much in your system. Body says, hey, we don't need them and just pees out the excess, which is uh, kind of a nice thing. So let, you know, lessen that chance for uh, overdose. So starting off, we'll talk a little bit about our uh, water-soluble vitamins. Um, again, I'll talk a little briefly about you know a few sources where you can find these at, uh, and then a little bit about some of the reactions they might be uh, utilized in. So um, again, not super uh, huge amount of detail uh, going to be listed out here, just kind of the basics. So you're kind of aware of what um, these different vitamins are going to be doing. So uh, first off is going to be thiamine or vitamin B1. Uh, these are very very important, uh, or this is very important for helping to convert uh, pyruvate over to acetyl CoA. So it can kind of help to um, um, help to start off that reaction so that way, uh, or not start off, but I guess act as a cofactor, um, so that way you can use uh, oxidative phosphorylation. You can go through the citric acid cycle and then eventually um, go through the mitochondria to, to form ATP. So if you don't have, uh, you have thiamine deficiencies, you can have problems um, converting that pyruvate over to acetyl-CoA. Um, a lot of sources you can find this uh, in, including things like legumes, uh, pork, rice, fortified cereals. A lot of foods end up getting Um, fortified with thiamine because it is uh, a known problem to where people are not um, intake enough. They can kind of have chronic problems, especially with like um, issues with uh, energy production, which can lead to things like fatigue, uh, impaired memory. There's a lot of um, kind of neurological uh, kind of changes that can occur, especially with things like glucose utilization within the brain. So um, that's why, you know, they they end up seeing like things like fortified cereals, including it uh, to make sure people are getting enough. Um, and so things like chronic deficiency can lead to uh, that neurologic deterioration I already kind of mentioned, um, peripheral neuropathies that can occur, so they can end up developing these kind of paresthesias or kind of tingling uh, in the periphery, you know, peripheral uh, limbs fingers and toes and things like that. And there's also a condition called beriberi. Uh, I guess there's a couple of different forms of this, but um, uh, one of them is uh, primarily concerned with uh, vitamin B1 deficiency, includes things like developing heart failure and edema. So again, very important to make sure that we have uh, decent um, supplementation of this within our diet or from other sources. Next, we have niacin and then riboflavin, which would be vitamin B3 and B2, respectively. Um, basically, these are utilized in the production of things like FAD and NAD. And we remember that those are very important for helping with uh, production of energy as well. Those are kind of our electron acceptors uh, that will eventually get shuttled over to the, uh, the electron transport chain and help us to generate uh, ATP. So again, very useful for, for that um, reason. Um, usually you can find these in things like meats, uh, you know, B2 you can find in fish, eggs, milk, uh, certain green vegetables. Um, so you know, so there's a lot of overlap in these different types of uh, products and as far as um, what vitamins are going to include. So I'm not going to get super granular and say, like, okay, well, eggs will contain which of these vitamins, but I'm just kind of listening for your reference. You know, obviously if you have a well-balanced diet, chances are you're going to get plenty of um, all of these different products. But you can notice, you know, if you were to have someone like, you know, a vegetarian, um, who was not eating a lot of meats, uh, did not eat fish or eggs, or de- depending on the type of, of diet they were following, um, there could be some deficiencies here if they don't supplement it elsewhere. So that's one of the things to kind of note that, you know, ask about the diet, ask about things where, uh, you know, big holes in their diet where they might be missing things if they're not getting it supplemented elsewhere. Um, Good examples of uh, things that can happen with B2 deficiency or riboflavin deficiency. You can see um, issues, and in, in with a lot of these, you notice a lot of kind of skin manifestations or kind of um, epithelial uh, problems. So things like dermatitis, mucositis can happen here. Um, impaired wound healing again, so kind of similar to zinc we were talking about before. Uh, vision impairment, and then with uh, vitamin B3 deficiency, you develop what we call pellagra, uh, which is kind of um, Several different things kind of going on at the same time, but namely this dermatitis, uh, and there's uh, some CNS uh, 
deterioration there, including things like dementia, memory loss, and also diarrhea uh, that can occur with that. Um, Niacin is also important as far as uh, a supplement for helping with uh, hyperlipidemia. So you will find that um, we talk about uh, treatment for hyperlipidemia, um, that things like niacin can be useful for helping to kind of reduce um, certain parts of the blood cholesterol and, and also kind of enhance certain things like HDL uh, cholesterol, which we'll, we'll talk about in, in pharmacology, but just know that uh, niacin can be important for that. All right, next uh, we have our uh, vitamin B6 or pyridoxine. Uh, this is needed for um, several uh, different uh, reactions, including things like metabolizing amino acids. Uh, from my standpoint, from a toxicologist standpoint, uh, pyridoxine is very important for production of things like GABA. Uh, GABA, as we've kind of mentioned before, is a very important inhibitory neurotransmitter that actually uh, helps to depress the uh, CNS for things like when you have seizures and things like that. So certain drugs can actually deplete pyridoxine. There's actually a few mushrooms that can do this as well. Um, and that can actually lead, lead to intractable seizures um, due to the fact they're uh, inhibiting the ability to utilize pyridoxine. But other things that can occur, um, you know, it's important for things like uh, production of hemoglobin, so you can see issues like microcytic anemia that can develop here. Um, so again, another reason why you want to get this uh, supplemented in your diet. Uh, cyanocobalamin or vitamin B12 is needed for erythropoiesis. If you actually have uh, deficiencies in this or in folic acid, as we've kind of covered before, this can lead to megaloblastic anemia, or these kind of immature red blood cells. So not necessarily infecting the hemoglobin synthesis quite so much as just the production of the red blood cells. And so um, cyanocobalamin is kind of an interesting one as well from a tox standpoint. Um, because I know you guys are very interested in this, but I might as well mention it anyway while we're here. Um, but actually, uh, we can utilize the precursor of cyanocobalamin. It's called hydroxocobalamin. It actually can, uh, combines with cyanide uh, and actually will form vitamin B12. So if you uh, have cyanide plus hydroxocobalamin makes cyanocobalamin, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and what's nice about that is you can have someone who's very, very sick from cyanide poisoning, uh, usually secondary to like a, uh, you know, a house fire or something like that, um, convert it all over to vitamin B12, and they just pee it right out. Uh, very, very nice, elegant way to kind of deal with a very deadly poison. And then uh, finally, we have uh, vitamin C. And this is very important as far as um, as an antioxidant, helps to inhibit uh, cellular damage, protein damage, DNA damage by these free radicals and things like that. Uh, may also help with fighting um, uh, certain infections. So not not may not help to fit infections, but may actually fight them. Uh, and of course, you can get them from several food sources, fruits, tomatoes, potatoes, all kinds of different places. And then moving on to the fat-soluble vitamins, so vitamin E or alpha-tocopherol, uh, also a very strong antioxidant and helps to um, kind of mitigate some of the, the inflammatory response. Obviously, um, one of the things you see with uh, very extensive inflammation is kind of generation of free radicals um, that can help to uh, destroy things like bacteria, but also hurts us as well if it kind of goes unchecked. And so vitamin E can kind of help uh, prevent some of that. Um, one thing you actually see is that with too much oxidation going on, especially uh, towards the red blood cells, it can lead to things like hemolysis. Um, basically, uh, too much damage done to the, the membranes of the red blood cells leads to them kind of uh, bursting open, releasing all their contents. And so vitamin E acting as an antioxidant can actually prevent some of this from occurring, uh, which is nice. Obviously, lots of different oils. Notice um, here that you know uh, I may not find quite so many um, fruits that will contain a lot of these fat-soluble vitamins, but certainly oils like olive oil, sunflower oil, uh, and then also a lot of green leafy vegetables contain uh, many of these fat-soluble vitamins as well. Um, next, you have vitamin K or phytonidione. Uh, we mentioned this being really important for production of certain clotting factors uh, within uh, the liver. So having deficiencies of these could certainly lead to um, coagulopathies or an increased risk for bleeding, bruising, etc. And uh, a lot of green leafy vegetables will contain uh, a lot of vitamin K. So think about things like spinach, kale, um, uh, Brussels sprouts, you know, different things like that all contain uh, decent amounts of vitamin K. Next, we have vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is uh, paramount for calcium absorption. Also helps with things like regulating certain gene transcription, helps with tissue differentiation. Um, certainly, uh, sunlight is, is a very good way to start off the production of vitamin D. Um, also, you can get some sources within things like fish, you know, cod liver oil, certain fortified milk. Um, the nice thing here with including with the milk is especially for um, certain patients who maybe have um, some 
holes in their nutritional intake mainly due to um, lack of money and things like that. Getting vitamin D fortified milk is good because you get your vitamin D and your calcium kind of all in one go, um, which is very useful for helping to prevent things like um, uh, rickets, which is a vitamin D deficiency, um, prevent making sure we're encouraging good bone growth. You know, so you see this a lot, you know, with, um, you know, uh, certain lower socioeconomic status patients and trying to make sure that they get um, you know as much nutrition as they can. This is one good way to do that. Other big thing is that um, activation has to occur within the liver and then the kidney. So again, you can start off with um, certain things like ergocalciferol or cholecalciferol, uh, which is vitamin D2 and D3 respectively. Um, those are fine, but they don't really work on their own. And so this is where conversion, and we'll go over that a little bit later, um, but having the, the first hydroxylation occur within the liver, and then the second happening in the kidney, then you finally have the active form. Um, so this is why kidney patients um, have an impaired ability to... Um, fully activate vitamin D. And so oftentimes we have to give them the activated form already um, to make sure they can um, utilize that to help with things like regulating that, that um, calcium uh, absorption, not only from the gut, but also reabsorption of calcium from the um, from the kidneys and also affect things like uh, bone resorption um, in, in order to release calcium there. Next, uh, vitamin A, or otherwise known as retinol, um, you'll find uh, that help is us very useful for embryonic development, which is why we don't like to give drugs that inhibit vitamin A. It's actually a category X drug. Um, the Accutane would be the one, so isotretinoin is actually an antagonist of vitamin A, um, and actually leads to very severe birth defects, and so that's why we actually prevent uh, pregnant women and or people who are uh, likely to become pregnant or have the ability to make sure they uh, you know, take regular pregnancy tests and things like that. But vitamin A is also very useful for things like T-cell activation and is very important for dim light vision. So if you have someone who is chronically deficient in vitamin A, they're going to end up having night blindness, where in low light conditions, they are very uh, have a very difficult time distinguishing uh, between objects versus if they're in the light, then they have an okay time being able to see that. And if you go all the way back to uh, the sensory lectures, you'll realize that was due to um, the fact that uh, vitamin A or retinol is utilized in order to produce rhodopsin, which we know that rhodopsin is very important uh, in that pathway for actually being able to detect light within the retina. So here's a good table kind of showing you um, uh, a lot of the different water-soluble and um, fat-soluble vitamins, kind of where you're going to find them at, what their function is, and some of the things that can occur due to their deficiency. So I'll, I'll leave you to that um, for a review. All right. Um, a helpful note on vitamins, just realize that most of them are not going to be regulated through the same channels as you might see with uh, an FDA or a Food and Drug Administration approved product. Um, there's actually a separate uh, law that kind of regulates that. It's the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Um, one of the big things, uh, the differentiations there is the fact that um, in order to bring a, uh, a vitamin onto the market, so say for instance, you are, there's certain vitamins that are drug products uh, for, sure, uh, for sure, but you can use a lot of them as uh, dietary supplements essentially so by listing it as a dietary supplement you actually don't have to show to the FDA that hey this product works right um, there's also a lot of labeling stuff that goes along with that so for instance um, you know you can't um, you can't market a, a dietary supplement that says hey this is gonna fix your diabetes because that would be a treatment for a disease uh, and that wouldn't make it a drug. And so the FDA would then have purview over it and say, well, where's the efficacy? Where's the safety data? Um, you have to go through our approval process. Instead, what they can say are things like helps to promote uh, regular blood sugar or helps to, um, you know, helps to uh, with glucose metabolism. You know, they can put little things on there um, that kind of supports normal body functions as opposed to being able to treat a disease, essentially. Um, so that's one way they can get around that. And so by doing that, um, the FDA doesn't have a whole lot of um, ability to have any oversight over those uh, manufacturers. Um, really, the only problem comes up is when you think about things that have... Um, documented harm to people that's where the FDA will come in and kind of say okay well now we can pull this off the market so a good example of this was uh, the dietary supplement oxycut um, that was uh, marketed for weight loss one of the things they found was that one of the products in, in the hydroxy cut was actually um, causing liver damage. And so once there was enough reports of that out there to show that, hey, this probably isn't just a coincidence, probably is actually linked back to the dietary supplement, um, the FDA was able to have them take it off the market. Right? Uh, either they will voluntarily take it off the market, the manufacturers, or the FDA will say, hey, you got to do it. Um, so it, you know, it's kind of interesting seeing that. Um, also, um, they don't, you know, manufacturers of these dietary supplements don't really have to show and say, you know, hey, we say we have 500 milligrams of vitamin C in this product. Um, there's no one that will actually go in there and make sure that they actually have vitamin uh, 500 milligrams of vitamin C in each of those tablets or capsules or whatever. 
So the problem is that is if you have some certain, say, less um, – Less scrupulous manufacturers, they may kind of um, kind of goose the numbers a little bit, and there may be some inconsistencies between batch to batch, um, or they may have just you know blatant um, you know, inaccuracies in their labeling. Um, so that's why I always recommend when patients, you know, I don't discourage use of dietary supplements, I don't discourage use of um, or these other herbal supplements, but um, I do recommend that they find a reputable brand um, and one that they can get consistently, so that way they don't switch from brand to brand to brand, because you may find differences in the actual yields on those. Um, uh, and so, you know, by switching from one product that says, hey, we have, um, you know, 500 milligrams of vitamin C, you switch to another brand uh, that may market the same thing, but only has maybe 300 or 400. And so um, that's why I like to make sure they, they stay, try to stay consistent with that sort of thing. Okay, so next we'll talk a few minutes about um, different um, aspects of regulation of metabolism within the body. So we're going to talk about things like the adrenal hormones, uh, thyroxin, and also growth hormone. So looking at the adrenal hormones that we have here, we know that from uh, the adrenal uh, medulla, it's going to be secreting mostly catecholamines, so things like epinephrine, a little bit of norepi, but mostly epinephrine. Um, and this is going to be in response to that sympathetic stimulation, so kind of fight-or-flight responses here. And we're going to see that those are going to have some more short-term kind of stress responses. So you'll see things like uh, increasing heart rate increasing blood pressure. Um, we'll also see uh, conversion from glycogen over to glucose within the liver primarily to try to help to in, uh, increase the amount of glucose in the blood available for energy production. And so this in general is going to cause kind of a short-lived increase uh, in metabolic rate, right? So you're going to become hyperthermic, you're going to be um, you know, moving around, the muscles are going to be working more, uh, increased metabolism is occurring there. On the other hand, with uh, the adrenal cortex, you're going to find that you're going to have more kind of long-term kind of stress responses, which may be good in short term, uh, but can be problematic within the long term, as you'll learn with several disease states, um, especially kind of, um, kind of pro-inflammatory disease states, you know, things that are really putting your body in a very stressed state for a long period of time. So think about kind of chronic infection, um, chronic autoimmune conditions, things like that. And so we saw within the cortex um, that our primary kind of stress hormones are going to include things like the mineralocorticoids, like aldosterone primarily, which are going to be responsible for things like fluid balance within the body, usually helping to hold on to more fluid by holding on to more sodium within the kidneys, as we uh, covered kind of extensively. And then the glucocorticoids, so cortisol being the primary one here. And this is going to have uh, mainly, as you might imagine, with glucocorticoids, it's going to have effects on glucose, right? Um, so you can see things like trying to promote energy production by trying to break down things like proteins and fats to convert over into glucose. And so, of course, one of the things you're going to see uh, when you're in a chronically stressed state is they get stress-induced hyperglycemia. This can happen either with the body's own corticosteroids that it's going to be making, like glucocorticoids such as cortisol, or if you're giving exogenous glucocorticoids. If I was going to give a patient prednisone or methylprednisolone or something like that, this will lead to the kind of the same uh, thing here. Um, important to note that not only will your blood glucose be increasing because the body's trying to produce um, more glucose in order to adapt to these stresses, um, but you can also see uh, suppression of the immune system as well, which can be, um, you know, in general, is anti-inflammatory in nature um, and can lead to things like secondary infections, which is why if you think about, you know, uh, say for instance, you have a major stress in your life, like, you know, a case where you're um, you're up all the time and you're inducing you know you're, you're drinking tons of caffeine and you're up all night studying uh, almost like like the next two years of your life right it's like one big stress response so your body's naturally going to be releasing a lot more of these glucocorticoids right so as you can see and I bet uh, be an interesting study to find you know what uh, a PA students uh, initial resting blood glucose was compared to what it is you know uh, each semester uh, during their two years in school to kind of see where they might uh, peak out at if I if I had to guess it's probably going to be the the uh, winter semester of your didactic year but um, I digress but essentially, these are these are meant to be protective responses. Uh, but in the long run, you'll find that these kind of long-term responses, especially from gl glucocorticoids, uh, can be deleterious. So mentioned epinephrine, uh, you'll see similar effects metabolically uh, to glucagon. So this helps to stimulate glycogenolysis. So you're going to start to break down glycogen. It's going to start to convert that back over to glucose in order to help uh, increase blood glucose levels from the liver. And then we'll also start to uh, utilize alternative energy sources like fats. So you'll start to induce uh, lipolysis. We're actually going to start the breakdown process of breaking down fatty acids from the adipose tissues. Um, that can then be converted eventually over into things like acetyl-CoA, where it can be used for energy production. And again, this is preparing the body, getting it ready for these kind of increased demands uh, that is in a fight or flight sort of reaction. 
cortisol is going to be released as part of that general adaptation syndrome that we mentioned before um, in response. And usually it's going to be uh, signaled uh, by through the release of ACTH or adrenocorticotropin uh, hormone. And so essentially this will also lead to things like uh, promoting lipolysis by uh, releasing fatty acids from the adipose tissue. So that you know, can be utilized for energy. And will also, you can see, uh, will cause breakdown of proteins in the muscle. So this is where the, those catabolic effects are really coming from. Because instead of something like testosterone or something like insulin being anabolic, meaning to kind of help to generate or kind of beef up the tissues, this is really serving to break those down. And so people who are kind of chronically stressed or chronically have um, too much kind of glucocord activity, you can end up seeing a lot of uh, redistribution of fat uh, that can occur there. Um, you can also cause issues with protein breakdown. So muscle wasting can be a big issue um, that occurs from this as well when they're kind of chronically in a, in a stress state. So again, looking at this slide again, coming from the adrenal cortex will be our uh, glucocorticoids, mainly cortisol. Um, again, this is what, if we were given this exogenously, this would be the same thing as hydrocortisone essentially. Um, but you'll see that it'll have um, actions on the adipose tissue to cause lipolysis to increase the release of triglycerides. So these uh, then eventually get converted over to free fatty acids, which can either um, you know, remain in the blood for a period of time or be converted uh, to acetyl-CoA in the liver, eventually to ketone bodies, which these can be utilized uh, for energy production. Um, also, the muscles will start to release uh, amino acids into the blood, which can be converted into pyruvic acid and eventually converted over to glucose, or the amino acids themselves may be uh, shuttled to different areas within the body. So again, these are catabolic effects or breaking down tissue in order to liberate energy. Another important hormone that's utilized for uh, helping to regulate metabolism is going to be thyroxine. And again, that's a T4. You also have T3, which we mentioned is a more active form uh, within the body. And this is, uh, you'll find these hormones act on most cells within the body and to help to regulate metabolism. Usually you're going to find these are going to have a, uh, effect to increase metabolism and this is really important for the kind of adaptive thermogenesis so essentially by increasing metabolic rate within the body you generate more heat and that helps with this cold adaptation these kind of calorogenic effects and so uh, your basal metabolic rate is going to go up people who typically have too much thyroid activity are going to uh, have things like sweating hyperthermia uh, increased caloric util utilization as opposed to people who have a deficiency of thyroid hormone they're typically going to have kind of a uh, much more kind of sluggish kind of a nature to them they're going to have um, more cold intolerance because they can't really generate a lot of that that, that metabolic heat there um, and so you know it's very easy to tell you know, if you see someone just like just kind of looks like a bump on a log uh, one of the things you, you check for is like, okay well, what's their thyroid function doing like is there a reason why they're so um, they have no energy and the reason why they're feeling cold all the time and things like that so this is kind of one of the telltale signs that, hey maybe i should you know get my thyroid checked out and so when you're kind of examining the basal metabolic rate for a patient uh, and looking at the effects of thyroxine, you can see that uh, basal metabolic rate has kind of two components. One that's kind of independent of thyroxine, which includes things like your, either your short-term kind of stressors, uh, a response to stressors, things like your sympathetic nervous system, um, things like your glucocorticoids, and then also your thyroxine-dependent um, uh, factors. So basically the amount of thyroxine activity you're having kind of sets kind of your baseline basal metabolic rate. So obviously more thyroxine activity, the higher your rate's going to be. Um, versus uh, you know, if you had a deficiency there. And so kind of thyroxine will set kind of your baseline, and then you're going to have independent things kind of on top of that that will help to influence um, the, the basal metabolic rate. And so kind of based on this, you can look to see like, well, basal metabolic rate should, you know, should be able to be used as kind of a surrogate for thyroid activity because we know there's going to be a portion of that that is regulated specifically with thyroxine activity. So again, um, thyroxine balance is needed uh, for kind of balancing out the, the anabolism or the anabolic effects in this catabolism or the breakdown of tissues. And so you can see that either with hyperthyroidism being in a hypermetabolic rate, you can lead to muscle wasting due to um, increase in, in muscle breakdown utilized for energy, or hypothyroidism could also lead to muscle wasting just due to the fact that um, there's not a whole lot of stimulation in, in the on the metabolic side to actually help to stimulate the actual production of muscle. So you can see weakness associated with hypothyroidism as well. And so I mentioned um, you know, cold intolerance and warm intolerance being regulated or being um, uh, due to partly uh, either hyper or hypoactivity of uh, T4. So next we have growth hormone uh, or somatotropin. We know, uh, again, this is secreted by the anterior pituitary, and this is tending uh, to have uh, anabolic effects on the body. So helping to kind of generate tissues, helping to 
um, you help with things like you know uh, bone and tissue growth, cartilage growth, things like that. Um, and we also see that it will have several different stimuli for for being released. Certainly, there's a time component to it to where um, things like sleep can actually help to uh, increase growth hormone release, uh, which is why they mentioned you know if you're um, you know uh, young kids get a lot of sleep, or if you're working out a lot, try to get a lot of sleep because this helps with growth hormone uh, release. And also even certain things like your your diet can affect this. So having uh, a large amount of amino acids and decreases in plasma glucose, such as after a high protein, low carb meal, can also do things like stimulate growth hormone, which is why like a lot of bodybuilders, you're going to see there's uh, they they put a lot of uh, credence in in their meal timing and their macro uh, nutrient um, timing to where like okay, well I want glucose after this sort of uh, uh, activity, and then here I want to have a lot of proteins, and some of it is thought to um, also be an influence on trying to stimulate growth hormone release in order to help uh, you know deal with that tissue hypertrophy. So again, typically uh, growth hormone is going to have primarily going to be more of an anabolic kind of effect, but it can have some catabolic actions as well. Um, so for instance, in the liver, it's going to help to um, increase cellular uptake of amino acids for the protein synthesis. So you can utilize that for anabolic uh, needs. Um, and in some cases, that can actually cause lipolysis and actually increase lipid metabolism. Um, so you're burning fat, but you're putting on muscle. Sounds like, you know, kind of a good trade-off in some cases. So you can see there's kind of a mixture there between the anabolic and the catabolic effects. Okay, uh, and then I think the last thing we're going to talk about here is going to be regulation of calcium. Again, so we know calcium, uh, the plasma concentration is going to be controlled by kind of three things, one of which is going to be bone formation. Uh, we know that calcium is going to be one of the major ions that gets deposited into the bone. Um, this is also one of our major repositories for calcium within the body, most of it being stored there. Uh, and so this is going to be a major source for it when we want to start um, increasing blood levels of calcium, we'll end up releasing it from the bone. Now we'll also see that intestinal absorption is going to be a major site for um, uh, influencing our plasma concentrations, and then finally urinary excretion or reabsorption. So you're going to find that there's several hormones that can affect this, including calcitonin, which we'll talk about more in detail, parathyroid hormone, estrogen, thyroxin, and 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, otherwise known as calcitriol. It's an activated form of vitamin D we mentioned earlier. So calcium, uh, looking at the different hormonal effects, one of the first ones we're going to see is going to be calcitonin. And this is going to be uh, uh, causing a decrease in renal reabsorption of, of calcium, mainly in the proximal convoluted tubule. So again, you're going to end up seeing that calcitonin is going to be released more in cases where you're going to have um, increased calcium levels already in the blood. Okay, um, So calcitonin is going to decrease the renal reabsorption in, in the proximal convoluted tubule. It's going to increase the positive calcium into the bones. So this can actually be positive in helping to form bones and, and to combat things like osteoporosis. It will decrease blood levels of calcium in the blood in general. So uh, for instance here, if you're looking at the and again, this is going to be coming from those parafollicular cells within the thyroid. Uh, if you have increasing rise in serum calcium, that's going to stimulate release of calcitonin. Calcitonin actually is going to block reabsorption of calcium within the kidney, so you pee more of it out. And it's going to deposit more calcium on the bones. So the net effect is you're going to have a decline in the amount of calcium that's available in the blood. Okay, There's certain things, um, certain disease states where um, you're having increased bone resorption or increased calcium levels uh, when you have hypercalcemia. And calcitonin is actually going to be one of the major treatments for that. Um, we have certain like, nasal sprays and things we can give to actually drive down calcium levels by affecting uh, not only the bone uh, dep deposition, but also the kidney effects here as well. You'll have parathyroid hormone, and so this is going to be... Um, causing, uh, usually this is going to be stimulated in cases where you have low uh, or falling serum levels of calcium. So you're going to find that the parathyroid gland is going to be uh, secreting uh, from here, from the parathyroids. Uh, and that will cause release of calcium from the bones. So it's going to cause increased osteoclast activity, which will cause uh, bone resorption to occur there. It's also going to stimulate calcium reabsorption uh, within the kidneys. Again, from the proximal convoluted tubule, there's going to be one of the big things. Uh, and then you're going to be finding that it also helps to um, stimulate release of uh, vitamin D or activity of vitamin D and will help to increase calcium uptake there in the intestines. Okay, so that's that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D there um, that's important for stimulating the gut to increase absorption of calcium. 
Also, um, you can notice that if you have a deficiency in vitamin D, this will also end up leading to increased parathyroid hormone levels because the body kind of thinks, well, if I have decreased vitamin D, I probably have decreased calcium as well. So those can both be stimuli on the parathyroid uh, to release PTH. And so one of the problems you run into with kidney patients is because they can't develop or um, release their own vitamin D or activate, I should say, um, they end up having, uh, you know, not only they have issues with holding on to too much calcium, uh, which can bind with phosphate, calcium phosphate can end up uh, driving down serum calcium levels, but they also don't have uh, much vitamin D, which makes their pyrothyroids just kind of kick into overdrive. And so usually their PTH levels are very, very high, uh, especially in chronic kidney disease patients. And again, looking at the negative feedback loop uh, for uh, PTH, so again, if you have decreased plasma calcium, that's going to signal the parathyroids, hey, we should probably start to release PTH. This helps with bone resorption or increased osteoclast activity. It helps to stimulate the, the kidneys to reabsorb calcium and also convert from the liver 25-hydroxyvitamin D3 into 125-dihydroxyvitamin D or calcitriol. And then that will lead to more intestinal absorption, uh, which will lead to a negative feedback. So as you rise or have a raise in the uh, plasma levels of calcium, that's going to feed back and then uh, inhibit the parathyroids. Uh, this slide is basically kind of showing the same thing, so I won't really need to um, belabor the point here, but just realize uh, as well that 125-dihydroxyvitamin D uh, is going to be very important for in, uh, stimulating that intestinal reabsorption of both calcium and also some phosphate as well, um, but this will also be able to feed back and inhibit the parathyroids additionally. So on the flip side of that, if you were to have increased plasma calcium levels, as you can see here, this is where you're going to see stimulation of those parafollicular cells of the thyroid, which will increase release of calcitonin. Um, interestingly to note, I think nowadays we have mostly a recombinant um, or kind of lab-made calcitonin, but the animal that we used to get this from, um, actually, I'll see if anyone knows. Uh, so I'll see if anyone in, in my audience here, uh, no, my daughter does not know, um, is actually salmon. So we used to get uh, calcitonin from salmon. Um and use that. So if, uh, back in the day when people had salmon allergies, um, they actually could not receive calcitonin because of this. But uh, anyway, the main point here is that parafollicular cells of the thyroid get stimulated by increased plasma calcium levels, increases release of calcitonin, and that's going to stimulate excretion of calcium and phosphate in the urine, help to increase the amount of calcium being deposited in the bone by preventing the reabsorption of it by this osteoclast, and that's going to help to decrease plasma calcium levels. Negative feedback uh, cause you basically uh, you drop your serum calcium levels and that will help to drop the release of calcitonin. So uh, again, other hormones that can be very important here, so estrogen being a huge, huge one. So normally estrogen has very positive effects on the bone and so um, this is one of the big risks that we run into when women hit menopause or they're not able to produce their own estrogen is they have a decreased amount of uh, you know, calcium being laid down to the bone. A lot of reabsorption of calcium occurs here and so this is why we tell older women who are postmenopausal to make sure they drink plenty of uh, calcium, make sure they get plenty of vitamin D and then this is why sometimes we will give them medications that will either Either replace the estrogen that they're not producing or it will give them things that will actually um, act as an uh, a agonist of uh, the estrogen receptors within the bone but actually will act as antagonists elsewhere so we'll talk about the, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators uh, in pharmacology but just realize we have drugs that can kind of um, simulate the effects of estrogen there on the bones and have positive effects You'll find that thyroxine or T4 also is going to lead to a decrease deposit of calcium in the bones. You may see some um, actual uh, reabsorption of, uh, of calcium from there. And then I mentioned 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, uh, sorry for this uh, typo there, um, is going to uh, be needed for intestinal um, absorption of calcium. So without vitamin D being activated, so if you have a liver or a uh, kidney a uh, damaged patient there may not be able to produce this on their own, so we all have to give them uh, this. Again, that's going to be calcitriol uh, is what we're giving them there. That's the, the other name for the activated form of vitamin D. Um, testosterone uh, also is going to be kind of net positive for the bones as well because it actually gets uh, some of it converted over into estrogen. Um, and hopefully you guys remember the enzyme that does that. It's actually aromatase. Uh, and it's going to be stimulating uh, bone formation as well. So again, men are typically less prone to osteoporosis, mainly because of the fact that they end up producing testosterone over a longer period of their lifespan uh, versus women who have a, a significant drop towards their 50s um, uh, due to loss of estrogen production. So um, again, the risk of osteoporosis goes up. It's not to say that it is absent for males it just tends to um uh, the risk tends to have a much more kind of a gradual decline or gradual increase as time goes on 
So again, uh, just another table kind of helping you to show um, the different kind of endocrine regulation of calcium here. And again, looking at this bone deposition reabsorption, again, um, the rates get determined via the, the balance between the osteoblast and the osteoclast activity. So basically, osteoblasts are going to be useful for um, generating new bone versus osteoclasts, which are actually going to be breaking down the bone and leading to um, increased release of calcium into the bloodstream. And so we, uh, if we want to have bone deposition, we want to have an increased amount of osteoblast activity. So this is where things like calcitonin can be useful um, for causing uh, increased deposition onto the bone um, versus uh, we have bone mass to declining uh, when you end up having um, you know, increased osteoclast activity. This is usually due to things like parathyroid hormone. So this is what we call bone reabsorption that occurs here. If this goes unchecked, that's where you run into osteoporosis. And obviously, uh, the more um, uh, kind of brittle the bones are, the more osteoporotic they are, uh, the much more likely they are to fracture. Uh, and we see a huge, huge problem with, with older patients when they have a fracture. Um, their mobility goes way down. Their quality of life goes way down. Um, you see major increased risk of mortality. So um, this is why you know we really, really try to, uh, one, prevent osteoporosis whenever possible, which is why we like to do bone scans and things like that, um, we like to make sure we do dietary modifications. Uh, because once they have a fracture, it is very, very tough to come back from that, especially like a hip fracture, vertebral fractures, anything like that, it can be very difficult for them to um, kind of make a full recovery. All right, so that concludes this material and also the material for uh, section three. Again, uh, we'll have the review on Tuesday and the test should be on Wednesday. Uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, though, please feel free to let me know and we'll go from there. Again, here's uh, more pictures of my daughter. It's basically the same pictures as before, um, but again, I think she's very, very cute, uh, and you should also think so. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.